Welcome, everyone. Um, we're thrilled to have you with us today, and um, we're going to have a very interesting discussion about vaccines and how they impact Arizona's economy. Um, my name is Joan Kerber Walker, and I am the president and CEO of the Arizona Bioindustry Association. Um, and it is my pleasure to um, welcome you all today. In addition, I would like to thank all of our sponsors and supporters that made this possible, including our patient advocacy organizations, our health systems, and most importantly, our physicians and physician groups. Um, today is a day when we are all having very high hopes for the impact that vaccines are going to have on our health. Um, but today we're also going to learn more about vaccines and our economy. So with that, I'd like, it to, turn, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Mike Mobley. Mike is the Executive Director of Research and Innovation at Grand Canyon University. Mike will be moderating our Q&A after our speakers speak. Um, I encourage you to put questions in the chat. And um, we will um, you know, go through those questions that we have time for, but we will answer all questions in a follow-up email to all attendees. So um, please remember, as things come up, don't be shy. Pop those questions in the chat, and uh, we'll be taking those um, and getting the answers back to everyone after the program is over. And with that, Mike, take it away. Okay, yeah, thank you, Joan, and, and greetings to everybody. I'm very pleased to be here with you. Uh, and certainly Grand Canyon University is pleased to help with this educational program. Uh, as you probably recognize, health education has always been an important uh, component to the programs at GCU. And you may not know that we're currently the largest provider of nursing degrees in Arizona. Uh, we've long recognized and taught the importance of immun immunizations as a public health measure. In fact, this fall, GCU again participated in the annual a university flu vaccination challenge sponsored by TAPI. Um, uh, also, GCU is currently a volunteer host of a point of distribution for uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, we're the only site in Maricopa County taking uh, walk-up patient appointments. Uh, I had my opportunity to volunteer at the site lit this past Saturday. Um, as Joan said, we've got a lot to cover in one hour. Uh, we will hear brief presentations from our three speakers, and then we'll engage in a discussion uh, and uh, with the focus on the key takeaways from their presentations. Um, our first speaker uh, will be Jim Rounds. Uh, Jim is president of the Rounds Consulting Group, and Jim brings a unique economic perspective to what we're de describing, describing today, uh, looking at the important intersection between a healthy person, a healthy community, and economic well-being. Uh, and importantly, uh, Jim's also a fellow alumnus of Arizona State University. So Jim, I can turn it over to you. Well, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to participate. Uh, this is something that's very near and dear to me. I, I have an immunosuppressed uh, son, which allowed us to do an extensive amount of research on how vaccines impact longer term health. Um, we've done a lot of work on the healthcare uh, economy as a whole, especially in the state. And I really gained an appreciation for the importance of the industry um, the importance that the industry can have in terms of an impact during things like this COVID recession. We actually have a recession named after um, a virus that's very unusual, but I think that this is a wake-up call that we have to start participating and discussing these things more and more in the future. And so I want to talk about the vaccines related to COVID and why it's important, but I also want to talk about the longer-term issues related to uh, child vaccine, childhood vaccines. Um, go ahead and change the slide. So how I start off all my economic speeches, not just what we're talking about today, is the recession ends when the vaccine is widely distributed. 
this is the only time where I've leaned on one particular fact or data point to identify when a recession may end. And the fact is we're going to have to get to um, a, a pretty high percentage of individuals getting vaccinated uh, two times in, in most cases, and it's going to take a little while. The fact that we've been advancing uh, the distribution of the vaccines in the state, uh, we originally were doing, I think, around six or 8,000 a month uh, a day, and the goal was to go up to 12. We need 20 to 30,000 a day in order to try to get the economy back on track where we can gain the, re the rest of the lost jobs that we experience maybe by the end of this calendar year. So again, vaccines are critical right now and they're also critical longer term. Next slide. Here's some context. So during the Great Recession, everybody knows about that. Uh, the US lost over 7 million jobs. The COVID recession, 22 million, three times as severe. It wasn't because of economic imbalances. It wasn't because of uh, bad policy or bad financial decision making at all levels. Uh, it had to do with the required uh, shutdown in the economy because of uh, COVID-19. Uh, next slide. If you look at Arizona job losses, this recession is about the same as what we had during the Great Recession. But keep in mind, Arizona fell to 49th in the country. We are typically one, two, or three in job growth. Uh, we fell to 49th. So we were hit as hard as anybody. And the COVID recession basically was about the same as the Great Recession initially. Uh, so that gives some context on one of the states the most impacted uh, during the worst financial crisis ever. We saw matching job losses just this past year. Next slide. When you take a look at a downturn, you have to put it in the proper context. And this is why shortening the duration is so important. The red line represents how long it took for us to regain uh, the lost jobs uh, during the Great Recession. And the kind of uh, um, V-shaped with a little bit of a, a curve going out on the left represents what the current recession is gonna be looking like. Now, the duration is gonna depend back on the distribution of the vaccine. And right now, even though we spent trillions of dollars on economic recovery packages, there is no stronger or better use of funds than to make sure that we're producing enough vaccines and distributing them and getting the, um, uh, the um, protection into people's arms. So that's the most cost-effective, highest return on investment economic development project we have ever seen in this country. And it has to do with the distribution of vaccines. Next slide. If you take a look at why it's important if you're wondering why some people are doing better than others during the downturn, this really disproportionately impacted lower income groups. The red line at the bottom are those are the job losses for the lower income groups. The lower income groups are also the ones that tend to have less money uh, to spend on healthcare, um, for uh, getting medicine. Uh, it's, it's a more susceptible group. And so we not only had a group impacted that participated less in the, in the advancements that we've made in medicine, uh, but they, th these were the people that lost their income, the limited income they had. And so when you take a look at this downturn, it, it was shorter compared to the Great Recession in Arizona, but it disproportionately impacted different groups of people. And sometimes you have to have different discussions depending on the group of individuals that you're looking at. Next slide. So, we discovered COVID and why it's so important to get the economy back on track. And what I'm seeing at the state level, uh, I love using these big parking lots, making it easier for people to uh, uh, get vaccinated. That's the key. Um, but I, I'm concerned about the longer term implications. And this is something that we chatted about last year a little bit too, is that what we've been seeing is um, uh, unvaccinated uh, children, uh, the percentage has gone up four times. Uh, over since 2001. This is a real problem. Next slide. Now, uh, there was one study that was completed where it, would just, it just looked at the children born in 2009 and the potential avoidance of some of the illnesses if the children were vaccinated um, would have saved us about $70 billion and reduced cost to society. 
but these numbers get lost in the people can't really relate to what 70 billion dollars means some people can but it's a very small percentage of our uh, of uh individuals so it's a big number but my main point on this is we can avoid and prevent not only the illnesses, but we can prevent the economic costs on society if we're more aggressive and we start to rely on science rather than dogma in many cases. We need people to be doing legitimate research, not doing searches on the internet for uh, anti-vaccination groups or things like that. We, we, we've entered a point in society where you can get information that's tailored to what your beliefs are before you have an opportunity to learn the facts. And I, I believe that that's contributing to this current problem. But a lot of what we're talking about, at, at least on the, the vaccinated, vaccinating children, this is gonna cause longer term illness problems. And this is avoidable. It's unacceptable to be going through something when uh, these uh, uh, situations are avoidable. Next slide. Uh, Arizona, I, I did a, a we, we, we looked at this last year for an op-ed that we wrote uh, for the Capital Times, but I, I looked at maybe 10 or 15 different uh, websites where it ranked Arizona in terms of vaccinations. We we're in the bottom 10 of all states. Um, one had us ranked as worse uh, in a particular category for children's vaccinations, and or maybe I, th I think it had to do with uh, growth in the number that uh, were not being vaccinated. But Arizona can do better. We pride ourselves on being top five or top 10 in a lot of economic categories. It's gonna be hard to maintain that if we're bottom five or bottom 10 when it comes to the health of the individual and the health of the community. Next slide. And so my final thoughts, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it, it's a reminder that we have to be diligent with getting information out there. We have to continue to advance science and research so that we can take care of uh, these preventable diseases longer term or shorten the impacts of the diseases as they present themselves new. And you know that this is gonna happen again and again and again as we move forward. But I do wanna conclude with the healthcare industry. It's such a big component of our economic well-being. In fact, in the past, when we talked about economic development, it was always advanced manufacturing, high tech. The healthcare industry as a whole is just as important of an industry at times like now, even more so than others and the healthcare industry folks need a seat at the economic development table. And that concludes my initial comments. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I look forward to our discussion later. You've uh, brought up a lot of uh, thought provoking uh, information there. Uh, we're gonna shift over to our next speaker, uh, Phyllis Arthur. Uh, Phyllis is vice president uh, for infectious diseases and diagnostic policy at BIO the biotechnology uh, industry, I mean, they've changed their name, innovation organization in Washington, DC. And uh, Phyllis brings a science and research perspective uh, and will be, dis be discussing how industry has focused on science to help deliver effective vaccines. So uh, thank you, Phyllis, and uh, I'd like you to take over. Super, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Joan, and also Tappy for inviting me to be uh, a part of this panel. This is a great conversation. And Jim, your slides were amazing. I think they really link the overall value of public health and individual health to having a thriving economy in a way that I haven't seen laid out uh, quite so elegantly before. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to steal your slides. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Joan, has, uh, Joan has, has my slides as well. I'm going to just spend I have about I have a bunch of slides. I'm gonna do most of them and then the rest of them are background in case questions come up. And these slides are, are all sourced. If people would like to have them, please do. They really cover what how how the vaccines are being developed, et cetera. And I tried to make sure they were slides that people could use if they wanted to. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the vaccines that we have, the vaccines that are coming, um, and generally how companies really tried to apply some of the most innovative science to the problem of solving COVID. And I think maybe then afterwards we can talk about what that means for the future of vaccines uh, in the discussion section. Interesting. Um, so just, I think this kind of gives you a feel for how quickly the response went. And, and I think uh, Jim actually talked about this, but 
very much that the farmers biopharmaceutical industry worldwide and this is a world these are worldwide numbers really moved rapidly to try to look at every therapeutic every diagnostic every vaccine platform and see what might be might help with covid and companies did this they spent their own money they took resources away from products they hadn't developed and they put them on trying to help like everyone solve this uh, this global pandemic emergency we were having and i'll say just in thinking about an organization like az bio and, and and bio as well not just large companies but a lot of small companies did that and a lot of novel products actually had the opportunity to get 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 the opportunity to get uh, you know an opportunity to get to be tried to help work on this and that's where you see the the advances we had in vaccines the advances we've seen in monoclonal antibodies were a lot of products were sort of sitting poised and ready to potentially be used in exactly this kind of emergency situation. Um, at the bottom, you'll see the link to the bio COVID pipeline tracker. It's at the end of the slides as well. This is a place you can go and, and sort of see week on week what's happening with development across the 800 and almost 40 programs that are happening around the world. Go ahead, go ahead. So this is a slide I use to just kind of give the, the immediate landscape of the vaccines and development. And it's a, a, it focuses heavily on the US, but I think we have listed some of the vaccines that are being developed globally as well. And you'll see, obviously, right now, Pfizer, BioNTech, and, and Moderna's vaccines are out there being used. We've seen some really exciting data from Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and Novavax. Last week was like a data palooza for, for vaccine information. And I think that's really good. And what we're hoping is that we'll start to see actual filings um, for J&J &J and AstraZeneca in the next week or so. And that'll give us that boost in the amount of, of uh, vaccines we have available starting to roll off the production line so we can really get a lot of people immunized. And then I think Novavax um, in the middle of, of their uh, phase three uh, trials now will be right behind that. Next slide. So I wanna focus on how industry tried to commit to, demonstrate their commitment really to the scientific rigor, transparency and diversity that were going to be so essential to bringing these vaccines to people in a way that people could feel comfortable taking them. And it's a very unusual situation we're in where we're not going through the regular development process. And I'll get to that in a minute. But we need to have, we need to figure out where are we going to go more quickly and what are we not going to sacrifice, knowing that we want to, in the end, immunize 600, you know, 300, 300 million Americans twice. <laughs> um, so, so in September of last year, nine of the vaccine company CEOs, large and small, actually pledged to really commit to scientific rigor, scientific ethics, um, and actually put safety and well-characterized vaccines and quality of manufacturing above anything else, that they would make sure they were communicating clearly with the American people on what their research was looking like, what their protocols were for, how they were doing on diversity, um, how they were approaching manufacturing. And you saw a lot of these things take place, you know, not behind closed doors, but really, you know, with, 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 um, with a magnifying glass. And I think that um, they, they really tried to showcase that commitment in every way they approached the sharing and dissemination of data across the entire year. Um, and, and these are companies that have deep bench in making novel vaccines but they really wanted to demonstrate their commitment to making sure whatever we did have was researched as well as could be done while of course taking into account that we had a pandemic ravaging the economy and we needed to go quickly. Next slide. So this, this uh, is actually taken from a fantastic New York Times article that I highly recommend people use um, because it has more detailed descriptions of each of the technologies. But I think it's important to say without describing all of these that the different technologies being brought to bear on vaccine development offer many different advantages. And really, I think it's exciting when you look at the chart, the, the sort of chart with all the companies by time and this to think about how we were able to leverage both technologies we know well and novel technologies with some data to try to get vaccines from experimental to in-human clinic trials um, as quickly as possible is partly because of all the history 
around these different kinds of what we call platform technologies or approaches to vaccine development. And they offer a lot of exciting opportunities to get a vaccine done quickly in terms of development and then get to the most important and long-term part, which is the trial part. Go ahead, Jim, next slide. So just a quick word on the two vaccines I think people are acutely aware, right? So you have the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, two injections about three weeks apart, very large clinical trials. Uh, these, it's important to note that the trials that the companies are being required to do by the FDA are head and shoulders larger than trials you would normally do in size. Um, part of that is certainly to make sure we understand these new technologies and the vaccines. And part of that is to make sure that there's a wide swath of people in various underlying conditions, varying races, ethnicities, who have had the vaccine in clinical trials and that the data can be robust around what we say about them. And I think that's why you saw 95% effective in preventing illness caused by COVID, um, really being able to clearly say, we didn't see either efficacy or safety differences in populations, including those with underlying conditions or those who are older. Next slide. And I think the good thing is, comparison-wise, the two mRNA vaccines perform very similarly, even though they're not made exactly the same. Very important to be able to see that same commitment, high number of, of people and participants in the trials, great diversity in the trials. Um, I think we'd all love to see a little more African-American and Asian numbers, but 10% is actually very high when you look at trials that have been done in the past for other vaccines. And generally a good understanding of the safety and efficacy of the product in many people. Next slide. Um, actually, I, I think you can come back to this if people wanna talk about how mRNA works. I left it in, but let's, let's keep going. So I wanna talk about the speed of development because I think that's one of the questions people have. Um, it feels unprecedented, right? It feels really fast. In actuality, the things that were done quickly were things that were really about applying more resources and more shared deliberative and collaborative thought to how we were gonna approach development than actually cutting corners on trial size or manufacturing. The, in essence, a lot of things that could be done at the same time, like scaling up manufacturing and starting to make production and, and get quality in production, and doing the clinical trials stacked on top of each other were novel approaches, but the trial sizes in each phase were actually the same as you would see or bigger than you would see in a regular development program. So a lot of the time was made up by doing things in sequence versus waiting to see the answer and then go on to the next thing. And I think the other things that saved time were literally that people put all their best resources on doing these, these, these clinical trials in the development as quickly as they could. Next slide. So again, three other products, four other products coming up soon. I think we're very excited to see the initial data on AstraZeneca and J&J. &J, and I hope that we'll be able to say very quickly that there's more of those products uh, coming as, as, you know, by maybe as early as the end of February um, and certainly the beginning of March. Next slide, Jim. So actually keep going. Let's, let's so, so I think people can see the safety system, which is key. But let's talk about the dose availability. Two more slides down. So I want to just talk about the delivery of doses because I think Jim made a really important point, which is we need to have more doses in more arms. Pfizer and BioNTech, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna have both committed to at least 100 million doses apiece by next month. Um, you're also seeing the Biden administration actually commit to more visibility for the states of when they're gonna get doses, which will mean, I think, better execution and planning for programs. So they're supposed to now get a three week window where they'll know what they're getting three weeks from now. A lot better for planning of real mass immunization programs, planning for diverse populations. And you, so you're gonna see an uptick in dose availability coupled with better communication from the federal government on when doses will be available. This should hopefully get more people immunized more rapidly. And then you're gonna see more doses coming out of Pfizer and Moderna, and then two new companies coming in in the next couple months, adding 30 to 40 to 100 million doses over the course of the spring. So I'm hoping that over the next month, we're gonna see real improvement in access and way more people getting vaccinated. And, and we need to do that as quickly as we can 
so we can really get back to real life and understanding how we can interrupt these variants that are happening. The sooner we can get people vaccinated, the sooner we can stop people from getting infected and, and really cut off the, the, the COVID virus from going from person to person. So I'll make that my last slide. I think that the other ones are there for background if people would like to have them um, over time. Thank you, Phyllis. I, I'm certain uh, there's a, a, <laughs> a lot to absorb there, and uh, I'll be excited to get into our discussion to understand um, well, more about you know, just how we're going to get these vaccines out to people uh, very quickly. Appreciate that. Uh, our next uh, speaker brings the clinical side into this, and that when I mean that, that's the actual uh, practice side, and that's uh, Dr. Andrew Carroll, who's going to be speaking to us. Uh, Dr. Carroll's a physician. He's the founder and medical director of uh, uh, Tembus uh, right here in Arizona. Uh, and in particular, he's, he's going to give us a perspective on the crucial history of immunizations here in our state and the challenges that we're going to continue to face in this area. So, uh, Dr. Carroll, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. And as, as very typical of a three-person panel, the third person um, realizes that the other two speakers have already taken up pretty much probably two-thirds of what I was going to talk about. So um, a lot of what I was planning to talk about anyway was is more anecdotal. It's going to be um, the clinical uh, aspects and what we're seeing on the ground. Uh, and, and then again, my, my personal uh, history and advocacy for vaccines in the state of Arizona. Now, I want everyone on this call to kind of just you know, you don't have to literally close your eyes, but close your eyes and think about what our lives would have been like if the United States had a 90% vaccine um, uh, delivery of COVID vaccine in December of 2019. Imagine if 90% of us were vaccinated against COVID in December of 2019. And then we received word in January that uh, there was this disease outbreak in Wuhan, China, um, that threatened to take over the world in terms of a disease with a one to two percent mortality rate. We, we wouldn't have had to do much. We, we could have continued living our lives, going to the stores and, and uh, seeing our family and having Thanksgiving. And um, all of those things would have been uh, mitigated by the fact that we were all vaccinated. Um, probably wouldn't even have to wear a mask, quite honestly. Um, but that's the promise of vaccines. That's what vaccines are meant to do. And if we had had that in place, uh, December of 2019, this, this disease that we are facing uh, wouldn't it, would really have minimally impacted us. Well, that's what all vaccines are supposed to do. That's what the MMR vaccine has done for many, many years. Um, it's what all these childhood vaccines are meant to do, is to help prevent disease death and maintain uh, normalcy to life. Um, and so resistance to vaccines is related to the perceived benefit versus harm. Um, a lot of folks who perceive of a vaccine harm um, are no longer uh, visible to the, uh, the benefits of a vaccine. Well, that's really front and center now. So many people have never seen a case of measles. Quite honestly, I've never seen a case of, uh, of German measles ever in my, in my career. I've been a physician 25 years. I've never seen a case of German measles. And that's because of vaccine, vaccine programs in place uh, for children that, that have really been done without question for so many years. Um, and, and so now that we have this visibility to vaccines and what the benefit and what, what it means in terms of us getting back to normal, I think it's important to keep in mind as we look at um, not only the, the delivery of this vaccine, the change in treatment paradigms around COVID, but most importantly, uh, how we think about legislation, how the government impacts um, vaccines uh, and what, what our government leaders can do and our, and, our, and our healthcare organizations can do to make sure that people understand uh, the importance of the vaccine and us getting back to normal. So, you know, if we think back couple decades to these debunk studies around the MMR, which yeah, it seemed to be a catalyst to the, this uh, vaccine movement, this vaccine hesitancy movement. Um, in reality, some of it um, had to do with the Gardasil vaccine. Why, why were we delivering a vaccine uh, for a problem that was really not that visible? Uh, and the reality is if you think about um, just let's think about women's health and, and, and cervical cancer. Um, back when I started uh, medical school, 
cervical cancer had a very, very high rate. And we were doing uh, pap smears annually in women, uh, especially um, childbearing uh, years. Um, now we do pap smears once every five years. And, and the reason for that is one, we understand that, that cervical cancer is, is a, is a um, virus driven cancer. 97% of cases of, of cervical cancer are caused by the HPV uh, virus. By preventing that virus, we then prevent cancer. It is the only vaccine that prevents cancer. Um, and that's why we see so little cervical cancer nowadays. I, I, I don't remember the last time I had a, a woman who needed to go for a leap procedure or a cryo procedure. It's been quite a while um, because we started vaccinating uh, teenagers uh, before they became sexually active. Um, and, and, we, we, and so now that we have this horrible illness, it's really impacted every aspect of our lives. I think it's important to once again re-emphasize the importance of vaccines in maintaining normalcy and then also uh, reducing disease uh, and death burden uh, in society. Um, you think back to 2016 here in the state of Arizona, we had a measles outbreak in an Eloy prison uh, and it was primarily um, prison guards that were affected. Um, and, and, and that was a, a pretty major thing we saw some cases of, of, of uh, pertussis in our practice um, of, of people who were not getting vaccinated against pertussis um, and, and, and mostly in adults, um, but then in some children and, and children had a high rate of death of pertussis. If you go back just 50 years ago, pertussis was killing quite a few children before we were immunizing them uh, globally. Um, so it, it's hard to, um, it, it's hard when you don't see a disease to emphasize to people how important the prevention of that disease is and how, how, how crucial it's been to, to maintaining and reducing uh, morbidity and mortality in, in everyone's health. But let's think about children specifically. Um, the infant mortality rate in 1900 was 165 per thousand. 165 uh, babies under the age of one were dying. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pretty significant number. That's 16% of all infants under the age of one were dying, primarily then of infectious disease. Nearly 17% of all kids just wouldn't see their first birthday. And another important statistic, if you go back even to 1800, let's go back to you know beginning of this country, nearly half, 50% of all children under the age of five died before they hit their fifth birthday. Now, you can argue that maybe penicillin changed that, maybe uh, uh, the, the healthcare system changed that, but in reality, the, the singular thing that has reduced both infant mortality and um, mortality under the age of five, and there's a statistic, you can look it up, it's called mortality under, the, under five, MU5, um, has gone down because of vaccinations, because of vaccine programs. That, yes, and treatment and antibiotics and hospitals and you know a lot of things that we know that we didn't know before, but vaccines mostly. Um, we, because we still see that there are high infant and uh, mortality under five rates in, in, in countries that do not have robust vaccine programs. If, if, you, if you look at some of these countries, these unfortunate third world countries uh, that do not have global vaccine programs, there are so many children who still die under the age of five because they don't have that option available to them. Um, we are very, very privileged in this country that we have the availability of vaccines. So privileged, in fact, um, that, that some people decline to have them, which is, which is really quite unfortunate because it's easy to do uh, with, with extremely low risk um, that, that easily saves lives, reduces the cost on society. Um, so let's talk about the, the, the difference between prevention and treatment. Um, I worked in the hospital this last weekend. I was at Banner Estrella. Um, I did three COVID surge shifts at 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, we're, we're admitting younger and younger patients. Um, my last patient that I admitted um, early Monday morning was 49, uh, no health issues at all, um, and can barely breathe. Um, it's a 49 year old man, uh, very, uh, very healthy otherwise, but knocked down like nothing, nobody else. Um, we can give him oxygen. Uh, we can give him some dexamethasone. Uh, we can consider remdesivir and that's about it. Um, that's all we've got. And then once he ends up on the, on the mission, on the ventilator that, that, that we're just keeping him alive. 
The uh, antibodies, the monoclonal antibodies you may have heard about, um, the bamlimonavab, I think I've got that right, um, is effective in mild to moderate cases of COVID. We, we don't have an indication to use it in the severe cases. Um, that has been effective. I've seen that work pretty well. But imagine it, that, that maybe three months from now, that 49-year-old man would, wouldn't be in the hospital because he probably would have gotten his vaccine by then. If, if we can get AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson on board uh, here within the next month, uh, we can start um, vaccinating much larger portions of our population. And I'm hoping, I'm praying that by the end of second quarter of 2021, um, the grand majority of our, of our country will be uh, immunized against, against COVID because that, that's the only way back to normal folks. Um, uh, you know, the double masking, uh, seems like a little bit of overkill, um, but when you have two horribly virulent strains in the United States, uh, the UK variant and the South African variant, um, uh, that's that's why that's being pushed. Um, and then lastly, I want I want to just touch on mRNA vaccines because I get a lot of questions from patients on on why why that was introduced, why why are we using this new technology that we've never heard of before. Um, mRNA vaccines have been re, uh, researched for over a decade. I know that Dr. Fauci um, was heavily involved in, in that vaccine development. As a matter of fact, I, I had to think about this. Moderna, the, the name Moderna has mRNA in it. Um, that was the primary focus of that company. And, and I don't know why, like it was about a month ago, I had that revelation, like, oh my God, it's, it's right in their name. Um, the reason mRNA vaccines were developed is because the old way of developing vaccines required you to take a virus and to figure out what kind of a cell it grew on. Um, and that took a lot of time to figure out if it grew on a mouse cell or if it grew on uh, a human cell line. Um, it would take months and months. Whereas with mRNA, well, all you have to do is extract the genetic coding from the virus and then uh, create the, the, the protein coding for whatever outside portion of the virus we wanted to target. And, if, and, and as you know, we've targeted the spike protein. In order to do that, it takes a couple of weeks. Uh, it's really easy. You sequence the, the genetic material of the virus, and then you create a short signal of the genetic material for whatever protein you're trying to target. Um, uh, and, and so it was so much easier to develop a vaccine that way, which is why it's being used. And so I try to explain that to my patients. Of course, they're hesitant. Of course, there's this uh, this rumor out there that we're changing the genetic coding of people is absolutely untrue. Um, just because you listen to a cassette tape of music doesn't mean that you are now a musician. Um, it's essentially uh, what it is. You, you're listening to a cassette tape and you're listening to a song and, oh yeah, I know that song. It's not like we're making you the musician. You cannot now play the song. Um, uh, but I vowed to my patients that I would take the vaccine before I gave it to any of them, that I would research it thoroughly and make sure it was safe. Got my vaccine, took pictures of it, made sure my patients saw that I got it and reported to them that it worked, it worked well. And I know it worked well because my whole family got COVID last month and I was with them and I was in their presence when, um, when they were sick, um, not knowing that they were sick with COVID. Uh, I heard I had already gotten my vaccine and I did not get COVID. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that this is the change we need, the, the, the movement we need. I'm also hopeful that the awareness of the importance of vaccines for helping to prevent and reduce disease and, re, and, and reducing mortality um, changes people's minds. And it's important that everyone on this call understands that, um, that, uh, that, that, that vaccines are, are really that important. And um, I think that's my 13 minutes. Um, I don't think I repeated anything anyone else said. So um, I'll, I'll open back uh, to um, uh, Mike and uh, hopefully get some questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Carroll. Uh, I'm really excited about the things that have been shared, that the three different perspectives. And, and I'm going to try and do a job of asking some questions that I think our audience uh, may be interested in. And I, I'm actually going to start uh, the questioning with Jim. But I'm going to set this up so that the other two of you, Phyllis and uh, Andrew, you can jump in with your perspective on this. Because I, I was, you know, the statistics you shared, Jim, uh, around uh, both the, you know, the, the impact of um, 
of the disease and infectious disease on the lower economic levels in terms of the, both their, the loss of jobs and the poor job. I'll have to just say the poor job we're doing being at the bottom 10 of the states here in childhood vaccinations. Those two figures coming together says we, we really do need to uh, do a better job. And so that's where I'm going to lead with the question, uh, Jim, is what can we do better to communicate this, that, you know, we need to, the relationship between healthy communities and, you know, uh, healthy economies and immunizations, you know, what can we do better now? You know, I'll start with Jim and then I'm going to th throw it to Phyllis and, and Andrew for you to jump on that, you know, anything we leave in, uh, because I think that's the, at the heart of what our listeners want to know is what can we do better to, to solve this problem? Jim? Sure. And uh, uh, first, uh, thanks, Phyllis and Andrew. I, I was trying to not make it look obvious that I was taking notes because this was really good information. And uh, Andrew, the way that you conveyed it, uh, I thought was brilliant. Um, it, and what we can do better is we have to have this kind of diverse messaging because in sometimes we have to convince an individual, we have to convince families that vaccinations are safe. Sometimes we have to convince policymakers like what we're doing right now, how much to invest in the distribution of the vaccine, how aggressive do they wanna be, uh, what kind of relief packages we need to try to get this distributed. And everybody has a different um, thing. When, I mean, you can, you can have multiple things that you think about, but each of these groups has the one thing. And with policymakers, they very much respond to the economy. And, and, and to be able to convert numbers, such as if we, sh if we recovered the jobs, the lost jobs six months sooner than we otherwise would if we took too long to distribute the vaccine, that's another $250 million that the state loses in tax collections. That also means that we can spend $250 million and have a break even. So it allows you to actually convert some of these numbers into business decisions, which a lot of lawmakers would like to see government operate under those conditions. You can't run government like a business, but you can start thinking about these types of things. And I hate to reduce something like COVID down to a return on investment, but with some individuals, you have to convey that. And again, this is one of the highest ROI uh, public policy items that I've ever seen advancing what we're doing. And I think that the support by the state government, opening up more sites, is going to have a remarkable impact on state finances going forward. But we need the full story. And the reason I really like participating in this is that I feel like the three discussions very much complemented one another, even though they came from different perspectives. Thanks, Jim. I said I'd go to you, Phyllis. Again, Phyllis, what, what can we do better? What, you know, this is critical. Absolutely. I think that, um, obviously, wholesale agree with what Jim said. I think, uh, and Jim, I'll say the benefit of taking that money later and the money now is you can kind of do a little bit of net present value and say, hey, the dollar now, here's some more money later. So I totally agree with you there. Um, I think that the other thing that I hope comes out of this is you're seeing more people come to the table, communities of color come to the table, like people who have not been in the conversation on vaccines, health equity, and prevention and public health are at the table now because they're seeing, for maybe really thinking about for the first time the impact on different communities. And, and I think Jim's point, if you added the economic and you added then the racial and ethnic line to that, you would, you would see even how much more uh, an impact that particular thing is having on communities wholesale, right? So essential workers, people who are making the least amount of money also represent certain communities of color who are then disenfranchised from healthcare systems. The opportunity to fix some, not fix, but start to work on some of these things in a really concrete way improves, could improve our overall well being and our overall healthcare and thus our overall economy because of our overall productivity. Um, and so I think you're seeing a lot of community leaders step up, talk about the importance of answering people's questions on vaccines, debunking misinformation and disinformation on vaccines and owning being the messenger. And I think that's the other thing that was missing to, to Dr. Carroll's point. We were missing some messengers that maybe had 
a different complementary resonance to the doctors and nurses that have been holding the front line on vaccines all this time, right? And those people, if we can get them to come into the table and stay at the table for vaccines writ large, could actually improve the entire way we talk about vaccines in communities that are, have distrust or mistrust issues on vaccines that aren't based in science. Can we get the Latin American and African American physicians who are currently really out there talking about COVID and encouraging people to get it and answering their questions to turn that same attention to routine immunization, right? That's, that's what we, we need that to be the next step because that would close some of the gap on routine immunization that Dr. Carroll was talking about. We need communities to hear from their own leaders that this is important for their overall health and their overall economic health too. Phyllis, we're going to have to transcribe that because that was such an eloquent statement. <laughs> All the parties that need to come to the table, I, I, I think that that re really is, is right on. I, I'm going to make it a challenge for you, uh, Dr. Carroll, to, to, to follow that. But I know you have a pretty unique perspective from the clinical side of what we might be able to do better. Sure. Um, so Dr. Williams Vaughn um, is an African-American family physician who works with me here at Atembus. Um, and she's... Uh, very well educated me on the challenges of um, overcoming uh, communities of color. Uh, I, I myself am half Vietnamese, so I'm Asian. Um, and same challenges there where there is um, a mistrust of uh, government and, and researchers uh, because of, of, of uh, transgressions in the past. Um, and, and so we spent a lot of time, uh, you know, making sure that we've uh, verbalized uh, our goals of vaccination in all communities um, to make sure that people are well protected. I believe that if we can, if, if we can as, as people, as, as physicians, as Americans, as uh, professional groups and as government, if we can create the conditions of, of vaccine accessibility and availability in a global fashion that more than anything else in terms of public health benefits, this creates a societal trickle down in health equity. Because if you can vaccinate, easily vaccinate children uh, while they're infants, while they're young, before they hit five and a half and start going to kindergarten, if every single one of those kids are fully vaccinated, they go to school now with as much health protection as each and every one of them can get. Um, if we marginalize any community and make it difficult for any of them, uh, either through uh, insurance challenges, government challenges, or, or even uh, echo chamber challenges, and, and I won't name that echo chamber, but we know who it is, um, then, then it, it destroys that health equity. Um, and, and we really need that. We really need that, that, that power of, of all of us uh, creating the conditions for health equity for every every children to have that equal chance. So, I know that's a pretty lofty speech, but, but hopefully yeah. that hopefully that's a goal you're looking for, Mike. Well, thank thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Dr. Kell. Um, this is going to be a difficult question for me to ask. You know, my passion is education, and a lot of the things you guys shared was we we do need to do a better job of educating, bringing people to, and, and understanding. Um, but one of my observations, particularly in the uh, and the recent controversies about vaccines, is there um, patients, maybe even doctors, think um, about medical care in terms of a sequence of problem diagnostics, you know, disease identification and treatments, you know, very linear, and the whole things that we've been talking about in terms of public health herd immunity, you know, the, 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 the broad scale protection uh, of the community, statistics and, and statistical, you know, impacts upon the community. Uh, a lot of people glaze over with some of those, you know, discussions and, and rightly so, because we're not typically grounded in that. So where my question is going, um, we've, we've got, you know, great health, public health professionals that think in the terms of epidemiology statistics and, and broad benefits. How do we bring that down in education and communication simply to the public that wants the best of healthcare, but perhaps doesn't understand 
you know, the, the, this sphere of where vaccines and immunization are having so much impact. I, I throw this out to the team. Uh, I, I know different people have different perspectives. Maybe Dr. Carroll, I'll, I'll start with you because you're oftentimes trying to describe this to patients, you know, and, and, and the benefit, and you've mentioned that. But more broadly, your questions about, you know, what we can do in, in public education. Sure, and I'm gonna give you an extremely biased answer. Um, fa family, phys not everyone has a personal physician. Um, and as a matter of fact, the statistics show that, that the group between the 18 and 35 year age group have, don't even know what a primary care physician is. They don't even know what a personal or family physician is. And so we've lost or we're losing um, the relationship that people have with a physician who is there not just when they're sick, right? That's the purpose of an urgent care or an emergency room. They get sick. They make a phone call. They even nowadays um, will just pick up their iPhone and 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 have a, a doctor or a nurse online who who helps them out right away. Um, so that is exactly what you define, which is problem solution solved. Um, where where in public health we look in terms of the longitudinal health of a community. And so my biased opinion is is that most people should have a personal physician. So most people should have a doctor who guides them through their health, through the, the, the continuum of their life, from pediatrics to geriatrics, um, so that we can then explain to them what the importance of things like getting vaccines, is, or what a colonoscopy is, why you shouldn't smoke, um, why your mother who had breast cancer in her 40s necessitates that you should start getting breast cancer screened in your 30s. Um, these are all things that can, questions that cannot be answered and should not be answered at the time that you notice a lump in your breast. That should be something that you're addressing beforehand so that it isn't a problem or doesn't become a major problem for you. And so the, the continuum of healthcare has been a loss a little bit, but I think that vaccines very much so uh, get, get uh, included in that continuum of preventive health, which really uh, is best driven by a personal physician. Mm -hmm. Uh, Phyllis and then Jim, did you have any further perspective on communicating and educating? The public? I think one of the things that has been missing from our education on vaccines is we have not hit the right emotional timber. Um, and I think that we, those of us who love vaccines and think like, I think like that, you know, they're one of the greatest scientific achievements of our, of our age. Um, We've been talking about that in this logical way for like decades. And what we need to do, I think, is hit that emotional core of people's desire to protect self, family, and for some people, community, right? But not everyone. I think, I think a lot of people care about self and family, um, and they're seeing COVID is demonstrating the power of an infectious disease to rip through a family and rip through a community in a way that I don't think, I don't think people ever really thought about. To, to Dr. Carroll's point from earlier, since people haven't seen measles or haemophilus influenza B or, or pertussis, they're just not thinking of these things as an imminent threat. And so I think we have to strike that good balance of you can do something about this and it will protect you and the people you love that emotional core, that, that I think that's the messaging that you're gonna see a lot more of around COVID. And because we're realizing that fear doesn't last very long. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't get you long-term behavior change. <laughs> and uh, you really have to give people that, the things that people enduringly care about as the answer for why they engage. And people enduringly care about their, their own health, but maybe even more the health of themselves for their family. Community. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I, I, any further thoughts on that? Those were two great answers, I'm sure. But uh, do you have further thoughts on how we might educate the, the public around these, uh, you know, difficult concepts? Well, I'll double down on what was just said. But uh, one thing that I experienced in having to communicate complex issues is I don't necessarily have to educate somebody on the details of this complex economic issues on a regression equation or anything else. I need to educate them on why we did something and why the results are valid. And I can show a bunch of statistics. I can give speeches that are 150 slides long. I have much more success with telling a story, making it real. And so if we can convert even more aggressively 
these discussions, the, the complications in the science that goes along with this into, I don't want to diminish this, but almost into selling a product because healthcare is a service. You're buying a healthier body, healthier body for yourself, your family and others going forward. Um, I think we have to spend a little bit more money marketing this as well. So the storytelling and uh, the other things, this is an area where I think at least government and the private sector, the hospitals and others need to get involved in the storytelling more. And again, you don't have to convince everybody exactly how the science works on the vaccine, but they have to trust that the vaccine works. And you just have to keep having events like this and messaging and having great speakers like Bill and Andrew and others chat about this and continue to get the word out. And the more we can do, the better. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Joan. I'm going to add my thanks to the speakers that I'm sure Joan's going to have. But I'll give it to you, Joan, to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And to all of our speakers, you were all amazing. Thank you so much for sharing today. Um, I want to also recognize our um, supporters and sponsors um, that you see here. And um, look at the people that put this program together today. The Arizona Academy of Family Physicians, the Osteopathic Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, our Arizona Chamber of Commerce, AZ Bio, uh, the Arizona Medical Association, the Nurses Association, the Pharmacy Association, Children's Action Alliance, Greater Phoenix Leadership, Grand Canyon University, March of Dimes, the Arizona Center for Economic Progress, and most importantly, TAPI, the Arizona Partnership for Immunization. When we talk about vaccination and the economy, and um, Jim, it was so nice to not be the only economist on the screen for once when we talk about these issues. And Phyllis, too. Um, that's right. So three, <laughs> look at that, three of us. Um, the importance to our community of having a healthy community is what brought us all here today. Because, um, you know, we look at the prognosis of disease. Well, the disease that has the best prognosis is the disease that you don't get. That's what vaccination is all about. Um, I think Mike may have me beat, but I'm probably one of the oldest people that you're hearing from today. And I remember growing up in a family of five children where five under five had chicken pox at the same time. And less than six months later, we all had the mumps. And that is not an experience that today's parents have to deal with because of childhood immunizations. We're falling behind on our immunizations right now. Um, for very good reasons, parents stayed away during the major outbreaks. But as we start getting back to normal, We've got to get our kids caught up. The last thing we want to see is to get our schools open again and then have to close them down because of a measles outbreak. The last thing we want to hear about is a child that um, brings whooping cough home and infects other members of the family who um, may be even at greater risk than our children. So when we talk about the impact of vaccines in our economy, Please take the words that you've heard today. Please trust in the organizations that you see on this slide and understand that we are together responsible for our health, our children's health, our neighbor's health, and we can make a big impact on that. Also, it's going to be a while before we have everybody vaccinated. Please. I know we're tired, but mask up. If you're not feeling well, get tested. Stay home. Talk to your medical professionals. When it's your turn, get your vaccination. And keep in mind 
that we will get through this and we will hopefully be better people because of it. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all of our supporters and sponsors. Thank you to our amazing speakers. And we will be um, sending out answers to questions as well as a link to this video once I get it edited and cleaned up, as well as um, the slide decks from Phyllis and Jim who have generously offered to allow us to share them with you. Um, so at the end of the day, um, stay healthy, make good choices, and um, let's continue the discussion of how we can make life better for ourselves, for each other, and for our communities. Thank you so much. Have a safe day. Bye-bye.